Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk general aviation with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. I'm the author of several books on the Garmin G1000, 3000, 5000 and Perspective, and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. First, I have some great news to share, which is that last week I did something crazy that I never expected to do, which is I passed a check ride to become a helicopter pilot. So today we'll be talking about what that was like for a fixed wing pilot to get a helicopter add-on rating and about steps you can start taking today to someday becoming a helicopter pilot. Last week in episode 282, we talked about the crash of a Citation 550 jet at the French Valley Airport in Southern California. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 282. And so you don't miss next week's episode in whatever app that you're using to listen to me right now, take a look for the subscribe key, or if you're using the Apple podcast app, the follow key, touch that key so that next week's episode is downloaded for free. And this is a listener supported show. So if you've ever learned something from the show that has helped make you a safer pilot, or maybe helped you pass a check ride, think about what you might pay a flight instructor to have helped you do those things and make a donation to help support the show. To do that, just go to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome to sign up to make a monthly donation. Or to make a one-time donation, go to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. And of course, those links are in the episode description in the podcast app that you're using to listen to the show. Coming up in the news for the week of July 17th, 2023, ForeFlight has a new feature. An iPad is being blamed for a fatal helicopter crash. And some important new battery technology is on the horizon. All this and more, and the news starts now. From avweb.com, ForeFlight adds a runway alert deconfliction feature. The latest ForeFlight release includes a feature that warns the crew of an aircraft on final approach if there's an airplane on the runway to which they're headed. It also warns the crew of the airplane on the runway that another one is headed their way. Aircraft have to be connected to an ADSB or FLARM receiver for the airplane on runway alert feature to work. The runway feature was among several additions to the ForeFlight app, including a function that will paint a breadcrumb trail of the flight path of nearby aircraft to give pilots additional awareness of the nature of the traffic and the procedures being used. From AOPA.org, FAA orders inspection of turbocharged aircraft. Citing ongoing failures and risk of fire after years of model-specific airworthiness directives, the FAA published an AD that requires inspection and possible replacement of all spot-welded multi-segment exhaust pipe V-band couplings installed between tailpipe and turbocharger, or up to two years of periodic inspections until replacement parts are available. AD 230909, effective July 17th, seeks to resolve an issue with a decades-long history of causing or contributing to accidents and incidents, some fatal, involving aircraft with turbocharged engines, including in-flight fire that can result from the exhaust pipe separating from the turbocharger and venting hot gas into the engine compartment. The FAA noted in the AD that the failures of V-band couplings attaching the tailpipe exhaust to the turbocharger, quote, have resulted in a significant number of accidents, fatal and non-fatal, on both airplanes and helicopters. The FAA estimates over 41,000 aircraft will require our records review with a cost of $570 to replace the affected part on a single-engine aircraft or $1,140 for twin-engine aircraft. Periodic inspection of the couplings without removal and replacement is estimated to cost a half hour of work per engine. AOPA notes that they do not agree with the cost estimates that the FAA used in the AD, which include labor costs based on an hourly shop rate of $85 an hour. Members have reported significantly higher labor rates up to $180 per hour. From phonearena.com, NTSB says iPad wedged in helicopter controls caused crash that killed pilots on board. The Apple iPad played a major role in a helicopter crash in Idaho last year, according to the NTSB. The helicopter, a Boeing CH-47D, crashed into the Salmon River. While rescue crews were able to pull the pilot and co-pilot from the wreckage, both ultimately died. The NTSB has yet to release an official statement, but Vertical Mag says that the agency released a public docket related to the crash. A section of the public docket titled Exemplar Helicopter and iPad Examination Summary reveals how investigators were able to retrieve the pilot crew's iPad from the river. Three gouge marks were spotted on the tablet, which investigators used to conclude the device had dropped and become wedged in the co-pilot's left pedal adjustment lever. Using another helicopter with a similar configuration, 
the NTSB was able to recreate the incident as the iPad wedged between the left pedal and heel slide support assembly when the pilot applied pressure to the right pedal. The report says that prevented the pedals from recentering while also pushing against the co-pilot's left pedal adjustment lever. As the pilot added more input to the right pedal, the iPad applied more pressure to the co-pilot's pedal adjustment lever. The co-pilot's height was 5 feet 10 inches, and the recreation showed with the seats and restraints adjusted for comfort, quote, neither a slightly shorter, 5'7", nor a slightly taller man, 6'2", could reach and free the jammed iPad. And they also add that the co-pilot's flight helmet would have made it almost impossible to free the wedge tablet. And by the way, we talked about a number of incidents that pilots reported having with the iPad in flight back in episode 142, and you can find that at aviationnewstalk.com slash 142. From theguardian.com, Toyota claims a battery breakthrough and potential boost for electric cars. And we're talking about this because certainly a lot of battery technology for cars may find its way into airplanes. Toyota says it has made a technological breakthrough that will allow it to have the weight, size, and cost of batteries in what could herald a major advance for electric vehicles. The world's second largest car maker was already pursuing a plan to roll out cars with advanced solid-state batteries, which offer benefits compared with liquid-based batteries by 2025. The Japanese company said it had simplified production of the material used to make them, hailing the discovery as a significant leap forward that could cut charging times and increase driving range. Kaiji Kata, president of the firm's R&D Center for Carbon Neutrality, said the company had developed ways to make batteries more durable and believed it could now make a solid-state battery with a range of 745 miles that could charge in 10 minutes or less. The company expects to be able to manufacture solid-state batteries for use in electric vehicles as soon as 2027, according to the Financial Times, which first reported on Toyota's claim breakthrough. Solid-state batteries have been widely seen as a potential game-changer for electric vehicles, promising to reduce charging times, increase capacity, and reduce the fire risk associated with lithium-ion batteries, which use a liquid electrolyte. However, solid-state batteries have typically been harder and costlier to make, limiting their commercial application. Toyota said it believed it could simplify the production process, potentially making solid-state batteries easier to produce than lithium-ion ones. From BoldMethod.com, pilot loses control on landing after passenger steps on the rudder pedal. And this comes from a NASA ASRS report written by the pilot. It says, Immediately after I touched down, the aircraft turned sharply to the left. I had little control over the rudders in order to straighten out. The aircraft went off the side of the runway slightly before I was able to correct the swerving back onto the paved surface. I initially believed I had a flat tire because of my limited rudder pedal control. After having the aircraft inspected, the mechanic determined that neither the steering nor rudder pedals experienced any failures. The steering worked perfectly fine. My passenger may have accidentally stepped on the rudder while bracing for landing. This passenger was new to flying and noticeably tense during landing. In order to prevent a recurrence, I need to be more diligent on reminding my passenger before landing to keep hands and feet clear of the controls and pedals. And from generalaviationnews.com, Aircoop crashes when pilot's great-grandson grabs the controls. According to the pilot, he was going to take his grandson and great-grandson on a flight around the airport in Frostproof, Florida. He told investigators that the great-grandson was sitting on the lap of his grandson in the Aircoop 415C. During takeoff, as the plane was lifting off the runway, the great-grandson reached for the controls, turned them to the right, and pulled back. The airplane veered to the right, exited the runway, and hit a fence, substantially damaging the airplane. All three on board sustained minor injuries. And the probable cause, the pilot's loss of directional control during takeoff as a result of a child reaching for and manipulating the flight controls. And also from generalaviationnews.com, attempt to go around in SR-22 proves fatal. This comes from an NTSB report. According to the ADSB information, the Cirrus SR-22 departed Creston Municipal Airport in Iowa and flew to Lamoni Municipal Airport, that's KLWD. The pilot received flight following from ATC until about 15 miles northwest of KLWD, an uncontrolled airport. The pilot did not communicate any concerns to ATC prior to leaving the frequency. The last ADSB information showed the plane on short final to runway 36 at KLWD with a ground speed of 74 knots. Several witnesses saw the plane bounce during the landing on runway 36, followed by an increase in engine noise, quote, as if just making a touch and go. 
Witnesses then observed the airplane bank left with the left wingtip striking the ground. The airplane then cartwheeled and hit the ground to the left of the runway. A post-impact fire ensued, and the pilot and passenger were not able to get out of the airplane. They both died in the crash. The airplane initially contacted the ground about 75 feet left of the runway edge and about 1,000 feet beyond the runway 36 threshold. Probable cause, the pilot did not maintain aircraft control during attempted go-around after a bounced landing, which resulted in impact with terrain and a post-impact fire. And whenever I'm teaching in these aircraft, I always tell people that whenever your right hand is moving forward on the throttle, the whole right side of your body needs to move forward. That is, your right foot needs to be coming forward at the same time. We've seen a number of crashes where pilots add full power, sometimes too rapidly, without sufficient right rudder. And from AviationSafety.net, Mooney accident in North Carolina. Last month, about 4.20 p.m. Eastern Time, a Mooney M20R, November 13, Lima Victor, was destroyed when it was involved in an accident near Southport, North Carolina. The pilot was fatally injured. According to a mechanic at Cape Fear Regional Jet Port, that's SUT, Oak Island, North Carolina, the airplane had been in for maintenance since October 2022, which means it had been there for, sounds like, about eight months. The private pilot owner had requested that the mechanic troubleshoot interior lighting, service the brakes, attach a standby vacuum hose, and repair an exhaust leak. The mechanic could not complete the work as he could not start and run up the engine due to dead batteries. When he inspected the batteries, he realized that they were unairworthy. Specifically, the airplane was designed with a 24-volt electrical system that utilized two 24-volt batteries. However, the mechanic found four 12-volt batteries installed. When the mechanic contacted the pilot about the discrepancy, the pilot instructed him to reinstall the four 12-volt batteries. The mechanic refused as it would have been an unapproved and unairworthy installation. The pilot then stated he wanted his airplane back. The mechanic told him that the airplane was unairworthy as he had not completed repairs on it and also noted that it was unairworthy on the invoice. Witnesses at the airport observed excessive white exhaust smoke and oil leaking from the airplane onto the ground as it taxied from the hangar to runway 23 for takeoff. Shortly after takeoff, the pilot reported an engine failure on the CTAF and that he was returning to runway 23. Review of ADSB data revealed that the airplane departed runway 23 and flew a left circuit back to runway 23. However, it impacted a residential area about a half mile prior to the runway threshold. From GeneralAviationNews.com, Aronka crashes after pilot tried to hand prop it alone. The Aronka 11AC was not equipped with an electrical system, so the engine was started by hand propping. The pilot reported that he did not have a passenger to hold the brakes in the cockpit during the engine start, nor did he use wheel chocks or tether the tail to a fixed object because he thought using the airplane's parking brake would keep the airplane stationary after the engine had started. Before the engine was hand propped, he set the throttle about a quarter of an inch to half an inch forward of the idle position. But the engine speed was much higher than he expected after the engine started. The unoccupied airplane initially moved forward before it entered a left turn on the ramp in front of a row of hangars at the airport in Wapakoneta, Ohio. Although the pilot was able to reach into the cockpit to move the throttle to idle, the airplane continued in the left turn and hit a closed hangar door, resulting in substantial damage to the right wing. Probable cause, the pilot's inadequate engine hand propping procedure resulting in the unoccupied airplane's unintended movement and subsequent impact with a hangar. And finally from avweb.com, Transport Canada taking part in autonomous cargo operation. Transport Canada has signed a one-year contract with an autonomous aircraft startup to provide pilotless cargo service to remote northern communities using a light aircraft. Ribbit Airlines founder Jerry Yang told CTV News the Ontario-based company has developed software and hardware that will enable the autonomous missions to operate on a schedule with minimal human intervention. Quote, from gate to gate, the airplane does everything itself, said Wang, who began working on the project as a grad student at the University of Waterloo. Yang said that Transport Canada deal is a research tool for both entities. Although he said the technology is thoroughly tested and believed to be safe, the contract will enable a real-world trial. As for the regulator, direct involvement in the operation will inform its promulgation of regulations and standards for this new type of operation. Yang said his company is aiming to apply the tech to aircraft with 6 to 19 seats because that's the sweet spot where the cost of training and hiring aircrew has an outsized impact on the economies of small cargo operations. Remote communities in the vastness of Canada's north are an ideal proving ground 
because many are already reliant on air transport for things their residents can't provide for themselves, and because there is no controlled airspace where the pilotless project will be carried out. Yang said technology isn't quite to the point where accurate interaction with ATC can be guaranteed, and a ground-based pilot monitoring the radio would be necessary. He foresees those challenges being overcome to the point where autonomous passenger service will be certified. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up next, a few of my updates. And then we'll talk about what it's like to add a helicopter rating onto your pilot certificate. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And now for a few updates. Hey, do you fly a Cessna? If you do, you're going to be very interested in this. In what is perhaps a sign of the times, Cessna recently issued a Hot Weather Operations Supplement 19 for the Cessna 182 TPOH. Notably, the supplement includes a new 50 degrees C temperature column. Now, just to save you the time of making that conversion, that's 122 degrees Fahrenheit. And I sincerely hope you never have to fly when it's that hot. Includes takeoff and landing distance data. And the client who sent it to me said that he heard that there's a similar supplement for the Cessna 206. Now, I emailed Cessna to find out if there's a supplement for the 172 and where you might find these supplements online, but I haven't heard back from them and I couldn't find them online. So, as a public service, I have added the 182 Hot Weather Operations Supplement to our Patreon website, and anyone can access that. You don't have to be a Patreon member to download the supplement. But while you're there on the Patreon site downloading the supplement, please consider clicking on that blue button on the same page and sign up to join the club and support the show. Now, you can find a link in our show notes that will take you directly to the supplement on Patreon. And if you're unfamiliar with where to find the show notes in the app that you use to listen to the show, just go out on the web to aviationnewstalk.com slash 283, and you'll find the link there. And now let's go to the good news department. First, congratulations to new patron supporter Aram Elmi. She writes, thank you for the time you spend in preparing this great content. I first heard about Aviation News Talk from my flight instructor, Stephen Briley, at Ace Pilot in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Every week I look forward to a new episode. This aviatrix strives to be a safer pilot learning from you and your delightful guest. Since I have just passed my instrument check ride, it seems fitting to make a small donation as a gesture of gratitude. Well, Aram, thanks so much for commemorating your instrument check ride by signing up as a Patreon member to support the show. And hello to your son, Daniel, who's also a GA pilot. And also congratulations to Joshua Lane on passing his instrument rating. He wrote to me before he passed the check ride with a question and then later wrote me afterwards to tell me he'd passed. And the question he wrote was, could you possibly help me understand the SUSP button versus the GA button on my throttle on a Diamond DA40? And I would assume that this is a G1000 equipped DA40. And what I wrote back to him was, when pushed while in the air, for example, at the missed approach point, the GA button does five things. First, it disconnects the autopilot in most GA aircraft, but not in the Cirrus. We'll talk about that in a moment. The other things are it turns on the flight director. It sets the flight director for the GA, GA mode, which would be the roll mode and the pitch mode set for plus seven degrees. It presses the suspend soft key, and it returns the CDI to the GPS needle if the green needle was selected for an ILS or a VOR. It greatly reduces the workload on the mist, and I tell pilots that they should push this button first and then add power for their climb out. Now the SUSP or suspend key has a couple of uses. If you were flying a hold in lieu of a procedure turn and were told by ATC to remain in that hold, you'd need to push the SUSP key so that the FMS doesn't sequence to the next leg of the approach, but keeps you in the hold until you push the suspend key a second time to exit the hold. It's also used at the missed approach point in aircraft that don't have a GA button, but since you have a GA button, you'll want to use that instead. And then just to touch on a couple of other points, the GA button in some aircraft is labeled the TOGA button. So TOGA stands for take off, go around, because you could push that button on the ground just before you take off, and that would set the flight director for a climb mode. Or you could push it at the missed approach point when you're in the air. The other thing I wanted to mention is the autopilot disconnect. The vast majority of GA aircraft I've seen require that you disconnect the autopilot before you fly the published missed approach of an instrument approach. 
The Cirrus aircraft are one of the exceptions to that. So for example, you can fly the entire instrument approach, reach the missed approach, fly the entire missed approach procedure, and leave the autopilot on throughout. So pretty nice feature of those aircraft. And a number of you live in California, so let me give a brief update on two airports. The Truckee Tahoe Airport will be closing its crosswind runway, runways 2 and 20, from July 24th through October. So aircraft should expect crosswinds and delays when operating there. And there's going to be a really big runway closure at San Carlos. That's KSQL. Now, that's a very busy GA airport just south of San Francisco. And the latest update on the runway closure is that it's going to be a complete airport closure for the entire month of September. And it's going to be closed during the night for the entire month of October. So I guess they've got a very major airport repaving project going on. That's going to dislocate a lot of planes. For example, our club has a number of planes there, so they're going to be moving uh, many of those down to Palo Alto during this closure. And here's a text message I got from Daniel Switkin. I taught Daniel this private, oh, probably six or seven years ago, I'm guessing. He wrote, Today during pre-flight, I found a small prop strike on only one blade tip. The other blade was totally undamaged. Very unusual. Yeah, I agree. That is extremely unusual. He says, I was giving a friend his first GA ride, and it was hard to scrap the flight, but I thought of your recent episode and canceled. I told him, what's the point of a pre-flight inspection if you're not willing to cancel if you find something? Daniel, I think that's really excellent. Very uh, good observation there. He later wrote to me and said that if the uh, engine was at 600 RPM, so virtually at idle when the prop struck the runway, there would have been only 50 milliseconds before the other blade came around. And to have only struck one blade means that, boy, that was just a very light touching for a brief fraction of a second on the other runway. So very unusual. And I want to thank uh, Brianna Richardson for writing me. She was the first one to let me know that the FAA has published a new version of the pilot handbook of aeronautical knowledge. Now, this is a really excellent book. It's been around for, well, at least 50 years because I know I used it when I was doing my ground study as a student pilot. It's really excellent. I highly recommend it. The best thing is it's free if you want to download the PDF version from the FAA.gov website. Or there's a soft cover printed version, which I think is around $31. And I'll include links to both the FAA.gov website where you can download it for free and also to Amazon where you can buy the printed version online. Brianna, thanks so much for sending that to me. And a number of people have written and asked if I'll be at AirVenture in Oshkosh this year. The answer is, nope, sorry, I won't be there this year. Turns out that my daughter is getting married on one of those weekends, and yeah, you know, she didn't consult with me about the date. Anyway, we're going to be up in Mendocino for a few days, which is her favorite place to vacation. And we'll be staying at the McCollum House, which is a historic Victorian home near the center of town. And if you've never been to Mendocino, well, it's a really quaint town located on a bluff overlooking the Pacific Ocean. The temperatures there are always cool because of the you know, cold ocean next to it. There's a lot of hiking and other fun activities nearby. And if you want to fly in, the closest GA airport is the Little River Airport, which is about a 10-minute drive away. So if you ever have the opportunity, check out Mendocino. And here's an email from Patreon supporter Dave Setzer. He writes that Sugarbush Soaring, which is a flight school with, I think, four gliders, is collaborating with the Sugarbush Soaring Association, and they are announcing a Soaring Discovery Day for youth, which will be this Saturday, July 22nd, at the Warren Sugarbush Airport in Warren, Vermont. The event is free and open to the public. It aims to introduce youth age 13 to 18 to the excitement of soaring. Participants will attend a ground school and tour the airport, and the highlights will include learning how to assemble a glider and watching the line crew in action as they launch and recover the gliders. And a raffle will be held at the end of the day for five free glider rides to be taken at a later date. You can find out more information at their website, sugarbushsoaring.com. And a tip of the hat and a quick thank you to those of you who have chosen to support the show over the last two weeks via Patreon. In the $8 category, that would include Kim Sun Win, Robert Emmett, Thomas Miller, Malcolm Jack, and Frank Irvin. In the $20 category, thank you to Nico Gallardi and Tom Huss. And in the $35 category, thanks to Aram Elmi, who we just talked about a little bit earlier in the show. Thanks so much for supporting the show. And I want to thank those of you who made a one-time donation via PayPal. Big special thank you to Mike Borch. 
Mike is a Patreon supporter, and from time to time, he also makes one-time donations. He donated $500, the largest one that he's done in the past. Mike, thank you very much for your long-term support over the years of the show. Greatly appreciate that. Also, thanks to Lynn Warner, who donated $100. Daniel Kadar, $35. Tori Peterson, $30. And Michael Ewers, $5. If you'd like to support the show, just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome to sign up via Patreon, or go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal to make a one-time donation. And coming up next, we're talking about how you as a pilot can add on a helicopter rating and how much fun you're going to have in the process. Stick around. All right here on the Aviation News Talk Podcast. Last week was a pretty good week. I did something I never expected to do in my lifetime. I passed a private helicopter check ride. Now, if I could do that at age 66, yeah, you can probably do it too. And if you're thinking, well, I'm not really interested in helicopters, I think I'll skip the rest of the episode. I strongly encourage you to listen anyway, because I never planned to become a helicopter pilot. I fell into it totally serendipitously, and it was a fun, challenging experience that was really satisfying. Even if you don't complete the training, someday just take a helicopter lesson just for the experience. I did one lesson 20 years ago and never expected to do anything more after that, but that 1.3 hour lesson was one of the most memorable flying experiences I've had. Now I've mentioned before that I was taking helicopter lessons, but didn't go into much detail. Now that I've completed my check ride, I want to tell you what it was like from start to finish. From listener surveys, I know you most likely have a pilot certificate or a student pilot certificate to fly fixed wing aircraft, and you're probably in the same position I was in up until a few months ago, which is that you only fly fixed wing aircraft. So the process I went through will be very similar to what you need to do if you go after a helicopter add-on rating. Now, the good news is that it's easier for you and I to do a helicopter add-on rating than it is to get a helicopter certificate from scratch, and the FAA requirements reflect that. Instead of needing a minimum of 40 hours of helicopter time to get a certificate from scratch, the FAA allows an add-on rating to be completed in as little as 30 hours of helicopter time. And by the way, I'm hardly an expert in helicopters, though we talked with one, Steve Bush, owner of Lone Star Helicopters, back in episode 165, about the FAA requirements for a private helicopter certificate and the typical hours required. Steve also talked about the different types of helicopters used in training and their typical costs. He also talked about the market for helicopter pilots and the typical number of hours needed to qualify for different helicopter jobs. So if you're interested in flying helicopters for a living, you'll want to listen to that episode, which you can find at aviationnewstalk.com slash 165. In the past, I've heard multiple people say that fixed-wing pilots like us should plan on it taking them about the same time to do an add-on rating as it takes for a non-pilot to become a helicopter private pilot. And of course, you should expect it to be more than the minimum 40 hours required by the FAA. My experience was a little different. I passed with relatively few total hours, and I'll tell you my secret formula for doing that in a minute, which you can use for any type of flight training you take, whether it's in airplanes, helicopters, or even airships. But first, here are some stats on my journey to becoming a helicopter pilot. I started taking lessons just five and a half months ago in late January. Since then, I did a total of 35 flights for a total of 44.7 hours in the helicopter, which included 10.1 hours of solo time. And if you add in that 1.3 hour lesson I took in an R-22 20 years ago while visiting the Palm Beach County Airport in Lantana, Florida, my total rotor time was 46 hours when I took my check ride. The total Hobbs time for the check ride was 1.0 hours, so I now have a total of 47 hours. And that secret formula? Well, the first part is preparation. You can certainly just show up at the airport with zero prep, and you can learn to fly that way. That's how I learned to fly in a Cessna 150 when I started taking lessons as a teenager over 50 years ago. But that's not the most effective way to learn to fly. So when I decided to take helicopter lessons at the age of 66, I decided to use a little of what I've learned as a CFI to help me be as prepared as possible for my first helicopter lessons. And I'm sure that following these steps saved me time and money as I was knowledgeable and prepared for my helicopter lessons, which was not really the case when I took flying lessons as a teenager. Here is some of what I did to prepare for learning to fly a helicopter. I decided in late December that I wanted to take helicopter lessons. I then spent a full month studying and preparing for my first lesson about five weeks later in late January. First, I started looking at flight schools in the area. 
The choice was relatively easy as there were only a couple that offered helicopter training. I chose a flight school that appeared to have the most helicopters available for training and which offered the Robinson R-22 and R-44. These helicopters have come to dominate the helicopter training market, even though they had some early problems when they first came out, which is why the FAA developed specific regulations that require more training time in these helicopters before you can solo. You are required to have 20 hours of dual instruction before you can solo an R-22 or R-44. I figured if Robinson helicopters require more training, why not learn to fly in them so that I'd be very familiar with their particular challenges. Besides, if I learned in a Robinson, I figured that later on it would take less time to transition into other helicopter types than if I had learned in a different type and wanted to transition to a Robinson. I chose to fly at Specialized Aviation, which has two locations in Hayward and Watsonville, California. Hayward's about 45 minutes from my home, and I occasionally am in Watsonville on weekends, though as it turned out, I did all of my flight training out of Hayward. I then spent a lot of time scouring the internet for good training resources. One of the first things I downloaded was the Robinson Flight Training Guide, which is available in PDF form from the Robinson website. I also downloaded the POH for the R44 and the R44 Cadet, the two models in which I did my training. And then I started reading, lots and lots of reading. Now the R44 POH is surprisingly short compared to the POHs for the airplanes in which I teach, so I was able to get through it relatively quickly. One of the first things I learned is that helicopters have a lot of different parts with funny names with which I was unfamiliar. So I started Googling things like Upper Sheave, which took me to copters.com website, where I found lots of great photos of these funny sounding parts of a helicopter. By looking at those pictures many times, I became familiar with the major components before I showed up for my first flight. And when the instructor did show me how to pre-flight the helicopter, I already had some familiarity with many of the things he talked about. I think he was pleasantly surprised to see that this old guy had done his homework and wasn't a total noob. I also started reading the FAA's Helicopter Flying Handbook. You can download this PDF for free from the FAA's website or buy a paperback version. And if you use the ForeFlight app, you can find it in the Documents tab of ForeFlight. Fun fact, you'll find my name, Max Truscott, mentioned six times in the FAA's Helicopter Flying Handbook. Those references are all in the ADM or Aeronautical Decision Making chapter near the back of the book. Another great website is Tim Tucker's Helicopter World, that's all one word, dot com website. Now, Tim Tucker has been a helicopter DPE for nearly 40 years and has given over 8,500 check rides. He's also worked for Robinson for many years as a test pilot and as their chief instructor. And his website is a goldmine of information. I also downloaded the private and commercial helicopter PTSs which outline what's required on helicopter check rides. The beauty of doing an add-on rating is you'll do fewer tasks on your check ride than a person who doesn't have any pilot certificate. For example, during the ground portion, you won't have to talk about weather or prepare a cross-country flight plan. And during the flight portion, you won't have to do any navigation or divert to another airport. So that I could stay on top of which task I'd need to do on the check ride, I copied summary pages from the PTS that list all of the tasks. Then I marked those pages up by crossing out tasks I didn't need to perform. Also, I made notes about the performance standards for each task. For example, landings need to be made plus and minus four feet of a designated spot for the private check ride. So that's pretty precise. Later, I created a folder in the documents section of the ForeFlight app on my iPad. I labeled the folder helicopter and I uploaded 10 documents into it. These included the private and commercial PTSs, as I wasn't sure which of those check rides I would do first, as I'll explain later. The third document was the marked up pages from the private PTS showing the subset of tasks required for an add-on check ride. I also included the FAA's helicopter flying handbook and the FAA helicopter instructor handbook, though I barely looked at the latter book. I included the R-44 Cadet POH. I flew the R-44 Raven II a couple of times, but didn't include that POH as it's so similar. I also included the Robinson Flight Training Guide, which I downloaded from the Robinson website. I also included a pre-flight checklist that I copied from the POH, though I always used the one that was in the helicopter instead. I also created a document I called Helicopter Knowledge Test that included all of the FARs that are different for helicopters. Finally, I created a document called Ground Lessons that I filled in over time with information I learned from various sources. I also put together an Excel spreadsheet for the weight and balance information for my helicopter. Interestingly, there are two weight and balance calculations for helicopters. 
One is that fore and aft center of gravity calculation, similar to what we do in airplanes. But there's also a lateral weight and balance calculation for how the weight is distributed left and right in a helicopter. I also watched a lot of YouTube videos about different aspects of flying a helicopter. I found a good one on how to pre-flight a Robinson R44, and it inspired me to make my first helicopter video, which is longer and goes into even greater depth on how to pre-flight an R44. I already posted that video for Patreon supporters to view. I also watched YouTube videos, including the ones from the Helicopter Lessons in 10 Minutes or Less channel, which goes through a lot of the ground theory for flying helicopters. Doing all of this pre-study ahead of time helped me get more out of my first few lessons than I would have if I hadn't done the pre-study. I continued doing a lot of reading and self-study throughout my training, and as a result, I needed very few ground lessons with my CFI, which saved time and money. Now, the other part of my secret formula was that I recorded all 35 training flights using multiple GoPro cameras and a Zoom H4n audio recorder. After each flight, I'd watch the video and take notes. Interestingly, I found the audio was more valuable than the video because it was from the audio that I heard the feedback the instructor gave in each lesson. Over the years, I've come to believe that aircraft really are lousy training environments because students spend most of their brain cells trying to keep their aircraft under control, leaving fewer brain cells available to hear and retain what the instructor is saying. And so as a CFI, I've gotten used to repeating the same thing to a client over and over and over until they finally get it. And when I'm the student, it feels like most of what instructors say in flight goes in one ear and rapidly out the other. One way to combat that is to make notes immediately after each flight before you start to drive away from the airport. But an even better way is to record your flight. And in episode 276, I talked about different ways to record your in-flight audio. Throughout the training, I used my Lightspeed Delta Zulu headset. It lets me record audio directly from the headset and has a built-in carbon monoxide monitor. And it gives you audible alerts through the headset at two different thresholds you set using the Lightspeed app. Interestingly, the Delta Zulu gave me at least one carbon monoxide alert on virtually every flight I took. All of these alerts occurred either after starting the helicopter while I was still on the ground or in hovering flight. I set the Delta Zulu headset app to alert me when the CO level exceeded 35 ppm and again when it reached 75 ppm. However, I couldn't see the exact readings unless I opened the app, which was impractical while flying a helicopter with both hands. So for many of the flights, I also clipped my SensorCon CO monitor to my pants leg so I could view the exact CO level by glancing down at my thigh. There was at least one flight where I could smell the exhaust while we were hovering, and since we'd been flying for a while, I like to determinate the flight early. So when you do take a helicopter lesson, I suggest that you have some way to monitor CO levels either with a Lightspeed Delta Zulu headset or with a separate CO monitor. And full disclosure, you can find links to the Lightspeed headsets in our show notes. And if you click on one of those links first to take you to their website and later buy a headset, Lightspeed does pay a referral fee to help support this show. I talked earlier about downloading both the private and commercial helicopter PTSs. I did that because I had the option of taking either the private or the commercial checkride as my first checkride. And anyone with a commercial or ATP certificate has that option. Ultimately, I decided to take the private check ride, and here's why. To take the commercial check ride, you need to have a total of 35 hours of PIC time in helicopters. However, since I didn't have a helicopter certificate, the only way to log those PIC hours was while soloing, and that meant I'd have to fly an additional 25 hours solo, above the minimum 10 hours, to qualify for the commercial check ride. So it was faster and more cost effective to take the private check ride first. And now that I have a helicopter certificate, all of the time I fly counts as PIC time, including any time spent with an instructor working on the instrument rating or a commercial certificate. Choosing a flight instructor is important, and we'll talk in more detail in a future show about how to choose a CFI. In this case, I used a relatively simple method. While talking to the flight school's front desk person, she mentioned that a particular instructor was their most experienced CFI, so I signed up to fly with him. When my primary instructor was unavailable, I flew with four other instructors, and they were all excellent as well. Early in the training, I learned from my CFI that he thought he'd leave for another job sometime in May after he accumulated more hours. My goal then became to solo before he left in May. As it turned out, I did solo in May, though he didn't leave for a new job until the week before I took my check ride in July. I often hear of airplane student pilots who are frustrated with the high turnover of CFIs and who have lost multiple CFIs while working on a pilot certificate. 
I never experienced that in the past, but I did get a flavor for it this time. In the five and a half months in which I did my training, three of the five CFIs I flew with left for new jobs. Those jobs included flying helicopter tours in Alaska, in New York, and flying to offshore oil platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. Typically, after they had accumulated 1,000 or 1,200 hours of helicopter time, these CFIs were moving on to these better paying jobs. My first lesson was learning how to pre-flight a helicopter. We didn't fly that day because the pre-flight took so long. What surprised me was that it takes much longer to pre-flight a helicopter than an airplane. And whereas most airplane pre-flight time is spent looking at the outside of a plane, a high percentage of helicopter pre-flight time involves opening five different panels to peer inside the helicopter at its inner workings. My CFI commented that he had heard that aircraft preflights were cursory compared to helicopter preflights, and I have to agree with that. I'm not going to go into detail of the preflight, but Patreon supporters may want to check out the 45-minute video I posted on how to preflight a Robinson R44. On my second lesson, we preflighted the helicopter, but afterwards my CFI said it probably wouldn't be worth flying as the winds had kicked up to the point where he didn't feel I would get much out of a first lesson. So instead, after pre-flighting, we went step by step through the process of starting a helicopter without actually starting it. And I've already posted that video on how to start a helicopter. After the first couple of lessons, I created my own startup checklist. And I did that because from watching the videos of my lessons, I could see that I was consistently making multiple mistakes during the startup process. Making my own checklist helped me greatly reduce those errors. For example, the standard Robinson checklist says, quote, cyclic slash collective friction dot 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 off. However, the collective friction lock is out of view when I was seated in the cockpit, and initially I couldn't remember whether to move the lock forward or backward to turn it off. By adding in parentheses the word forward to my checklist, I always knew how to disengage the collective friction lock. I also noticed that I had a bad habit of screwing down the cyclic friction lock very tight while my CFI said that I should be making it finger tight. So the words finger tight went into my checklist. Now these are just a few of the many changes I made to customize my checklist to make it more helpful when I started the helicopter. And you may want to do the same thing for any aircraft you fly. For example, ForeFlight lets you create custom checklists. I did finally fly on my third lesson. We spent all of that time hovering along a taxiway at the Hayward Airport, but I didn't immediately get all of the controls. Instead, my CFI introduced me to one control at a time. First, he gave me the anti-torque pedals while he operated the other controls. The pedals control yaw, or the left and right turning motion, much like the rudder pedals in an aircraft control yaw. So it was fairly simple for me to apply gentle pressure to the pedals to keep the helicopter pointed straight down the taxiway. Later, my CFI gave me control of just the collective, the lever between the two seats. It controls the pitch of the main rotor blades, and indirectly it also controls the throttle through a mechanical correlator that increases the throttle as you raise the collective. My goal was to use the collective to keep us at a constant height above the runway, about 3 to 5 feet. More power is required to hover at higher heights, and less power is required to hover at lower heights. One interesting thing is that if the helicopter settles down a little, you don't necessarily need to add extra collective to stay aloft, because as it settles, it reaches a height where it needs less power to hover. So at a given hover power setting, the helicopter may go up and down a little, but it won't settle to the ground. Later, instructor Chris gave me the cyclic as he operated the other controls. As you may know, the cyclic changes the tilt to the main rotor, and hence the direction in which you'll travel. So pushing the cyclic forward gives you forward motion. And the amount of movement required to control the cyclic is tiny compared to the amount of movement required to operate any airplane controls. Now, one small advantage I think I had was that about 10 years ago, my wife expressed an interest in learning to fly RC or radio controlled model planes, and we learned to do it together. The motion required to move the joysticks on an RC transmitter are tiny. So when I took over the control of the cyclic, I imagined that I was making the same tiny motions required to control an RC airplane, and that worked well for me. Also, one of the other instructors that I flew with during my early lessons passed along a very helpful tip. He said that instead of moving the cyclic to a new position and leaving it there, usually I should move the cyclic a small amount to a new position, and then almost immediately return the cyclic back to the prior position. And as I watched my videos, I could see that my hand often moved the cyclic back and forth in less than a second, and then paused before doing it again in some other direction. My second flight was great fun. We flew my first traffic patterns, which were very satisfying, 
and somewhat easy as they resembled flying an airplane in the traffic pattern. One of the more interesting things about landing a helicopter is that as we slow to around 20 to 25 knots, we start to get loud vibrations. If we continue to get even slower and the vibrations stop, we need a lot more power to maintain flight. We also left the traffic pattern of loose some slow speed maneuvers, and I laughed every time the CFI said, now slow to 40 knots, now slow to 30 knots, now slow to 20 knots, as those speeds just seem so ridiculously slow compared to the ones you and I are used to flying in an airplane. I also discovered that the rotors make a flapping sound if the power is too low, or if we were in a descending turn. In flight, you also need to watch the yaw strings, which are essentially two pieces of yarn attached to the center of the windshield. To fly in trim, pilots need to adjust the anti-torque pedals as they fly so that the two strings are symmetrical. It's similar to using the pedals to keep the ball centered in the slip skid indicator in an airplane. On my third flight, I flew with Paul, a German CFI who's now flying in Alaska. He showed me how on the ground before lifting up, I could find this sweet spot in the cyclic by moving it to a point where I felt the least amount of vibration from the blades. That's where I would position the cyclic before picking up or lifting up from our parking spot. He pointed out that when I flew a traffic pattern and came to a hover over the numbers, that I was consistently to the right of center on my landings, and that's because of the translating tendency, which is that helicopters have a tendency to move to the right as you add power because of increased thrust from the tail rotor. We also did a steep approach, something I practiced a lot when I was solo. On the check ride, there are three types of approaches required. A shallow approach, which is about a three to five degree angle, somewhat higher than most airplanes land. A normal approach at about a 10 degree angle and a steep approach at a 13 to 15 degree angle. In general, I tended to fly a three degree approach, which was normal for an airplane, but low for a helicopter. Steep approaches were very challenging as the final approach is very slow, less than 25 knots, at speeds at which the main rotor blade is vibrating, something I found yeah, a little disconcerting. When I practiced these later while soloing, I tended to overshoot my touchdown point as I didn't slow down enough to get into the vibrations. I eventually got to the point where I could do steep approaches, but they never felt comfortable and I found myself tensing up a little bit and sometimes holding my breath. We also did a few running landings in which we touched down on the runway with a small forward speed, perhaps 10 to 15 knots, and slide to a stop on the runway. You might need to do this if you lack sufficient power to enter a hover, and that could happen if you were at a high density altitude, were carrying a heavy load, or if the engine wasn't putting out full power because of some mechanical difficulty. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of each flight lesson. For that, you can watch my videos as I release them, but here are a few things we did on subsequent flights. We did the required night flying early in the training, as I wanted to complete it before the change to daylight saving time, so I wouldn't have any late night drives back home. We did the required night cross-country flight first. For airplanes, you need to fly to an airport more than 50 miles away for it to count as cross-country time. But for helicopters, you only need to fly more than 25 miles away for the flight to count as cross-country. However, for the commercial certificate, there's a requirement for a dual night flight of two hours or more to an airport over 50 miles away. So we flew to Modesto, which is over 50 miles away, and logged the flight so that it could count for either the private or the commercial night requirement. That was the first flight where I felt truly relaxed. I had such a great time. We had a lot of time in cruise at 2,500 feet, and I found I was no longer gripping the cyclic tightly, but just holding it lightly between my fingers. Very fun, memorable flight. The next night, we did our second night flight, where we did eight additional night landings, all at the Hayward Airport. It was on this flight I realized that I needed to progressively add even more right pedal than I was adding during the takeoffs. And I spotted that because we had our landing light on, and it was easy to see when the helicopter was yawed to the left of the center line during takeoff. As the evenings progressed, I did a better job of tracking the center line because the landing light gave a precise indication of my heading. Soon after that, uh, we started auto rotations. Now that's the maneuver you perform if the engine were to quit. There are a number of steps required when you enter the maneuver, such as lowering the collective and pressing right pedal, pulling the cyclic a little aft and turning off the throttle. Now, the biggest challenge I had was figuring out how far I would glide so that I could reach a particular spot. On the private check ride, you're required to terminate the maneuver to a hover and do that within plus or minus 200 feet of a designated spot. Now, a typical airplane may have a glide ratio of 7 or maybe 8 to 1, but the glide ratio in the R44 
is closer to four to one or about half the distance you might glide in an airplane. So if I wanted to end up with the runway numbers, I'd make sure that I was still at about 800 feet while on short final. I'd wait until the runway numbers looked ridiculously low on the windshield, not quite all the way down by my feet, but still pretty low, and then I'd start the maneuver. But most of the time I'd come up short because the view you're looking for is totally different from the view you'd ever have landing an airplane. I continued to practice auto rotations until the day before my check ride, and even then I wasn't completely sure I'd pass that maneuver on the check ride. At the end of the auto rotation, when we were perhaps 40 feet above the ground, we'd pull back in the cyclic to arrest our descent rate and slow our airspeed. Helicopter instructors refer to that as a flare, but it's far more aggressive than any flare we use when landing an airplane. So airplane instructors, if you someday find yourself teaching a helicopter pilot how to land an airplane, you need to first demonstrate what a flare looks like in an airplane. Otherwise, if you just ask a helicopter pilot to flare without giving some demonstration, you could find yourself pitched up at a dangerously high attitude. After slowing the helicopter with a flare, you need to increase the throttle, pull up the collective, and add left pedal. And it also became clear to me that I also needed to add some left cyclic at the end. Otherwise, the translating tendency, which increases as you pull the collective, would move the helicopter to the right side of the runway. I always enjoyed when we left the airport to fly in the nearby hills. On a couple of those flights, we did pinnacle landings where we would circle a high point at about 500 feet AGL and later at 300 feet AGL as we checked the wind direction, looked for obstacles, and chose an approach path to and from our intended landing spot. We then fly a somewhat steep approach to that spot and hover above it. We certainly didn't want to land on that spot with its dry grass, as there's a chance our hot exhaust could have set the grass on fire. We also did confined landings, where we'd land in a tight spot hemmed in by very close terrain that was above us. And there were a number of other maneuvers we did during the training, but this gives you a flavor for how we spent most of the training time. Now here's some of my overall impressions. The mechanics of flying a helicopter were a little easier than I thought they'd be. While hovering seemed difficult at first, I could do a credible job after a couple of lessons. And flying a traffic pattern and making a shallow landing was fairly easy. However, the emergency procedures, such as auto rotations, felt more difficult than emergency procedures in an airplane. For example, if the engine were to quit suddenly, at higher power levels, you literally would have just a second or two to get the collective all the way down, or the main rotor could get so slow that it would fold up on you, and that would be the end of it. So for some emergencies, the reaction time required in a helicopter has to be much faster than it needs to be in an airplane. Also, it seemed like there were more emergency procedures in a helicopter, but I never counted them, so that might not be true. So while the basic mechanics of flying a helicopter were easier than I expected, the ground study, especially the aerodynamics, was more extensive than I expected. I had to read through it over and over during the training, and it was also totally different from the aerodynamics of flying airplanes. So what's next? Well, now that I have my private ticket, I can rent a helicopter. But to be able to fly solo, I need to fly with an instructor every 30 days. And that's very different from my club's requirements for renting an airplane, where you need to fly every 60 days. And if you do, you don't need to fly with a CFI again until it's time for your flight review. So my sense is that helicopter pilots can lose their skills more rapidly, which is probably why the flight school wants you flying with an instructor every 30 days. And since I need to fly with a CFI so often, I'll probably add on my instrument rating. Since I already have an instrument rating, I only need 15 hours of helicopter instrument instruction, far less than the 40 hours of instrument instruction required in a helicopter if you don't already have an instrument rating. And I'll always be indebted to Dr. Victor Vogel, who we talked with in episode 257 about aging and how learning new things may help to stem mental decline as we get older. That conversation inspired me to try something really hard to get a helicopter add-on rating. Victor, thank you so much for being that inspiration. And now I hope I've inspired you to take on a new challenge, perhaps even a helicopter add-on rating. If you have feedback or insights about this episode or anything else you'd like to share, please go to aviationnewstalk.com, click on contact at the top of the page, and send me an email. And I'll read some of your emails on a future show. Also, think about what you might pay a CFI for an hour of flight instruction. And if you've been learning things from the show, please consider sending a donation in that amount. It's easy to join the club and become a member to support Aviation News Talk. Just go to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. Choose the dollar amount you'd like to pledge to support the show. Or you can make a one-time donation at aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. And thanks to everyone who supports the show in whatever way you do. 
So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up, and remember that you can always go around. You can